Okay, we're going to go ahead and start now, and um, we're going to start our dis discussion of the digestive system, and uh, we'll go about halfway through. There's a lot of material here, and we'll finish it up next week, and that'll be the end of uh, lab. So next Thursday is our last lab for the semester, so we don't have to meet anymore in the afternoons. So anyway, let's go ahead and... Let me open this up, oh, wrong thing. There we go, let's try this again. There we go, share screen. And this is, yeah, this is it. Okay, so the human digestive system in here. Our digestive tract or the alimentary tract or the alimentary canal or the food tube, if you will, is a, is a structure that's a tube shaped structure about 30 feet long. It starts at the mouth and ends at the anus. It is open to the outside of the body, uh, technically, because we have the opening at the mouth or the opening at the anus. So therefore it's lined with epithelial cells, mostly stratified squamous epithelial. Uh, in some cases, simple. Uh, stratified, in some cases, simple columnar cells, but it is open to the outside. We move food through this uh, digestive tract through a mechanism known as peristalsis. See, our, our, our digestive tract is lined with two layers of smooth muscle running in opposite directions from each other. And so we use that to squeeze food along. Most of the digestion takes place in our stomach, even though we start at, in our mouth, most of our digestion starts in our, uh, continues in our stomach. And then in the small, in the first 10 inches of the small intestine, and then the remaining portion of the small intestine, the remaining 19 feet of it is where we absorb our nutrients. And whatever we can't absorb ends up in the large intestine and eventually is released as fecal matter. Oops. Processes of digestion include eating, ingesting the food into our mouth. Food, you know, we, we uh, whether it's a solid food or a liquid food, we take it into our mouth. We then allow it to enter into the esophagus. We swallow it. If it's a solid food, after we chew it up, uh, masticate it, if you will, mix it with saliva, expose it to enzymes in our saliva, we manipulate the food into a little ball called a bolus, and then we swallow the bolus and we use our teeth and our tongue to manipulate to get to the point of the bolus. The bolus then goes into our esophagus. Once we get that bolus to the stomach is where most of the digestive processes take place. Now, in our mouth, we do release some digestive enzymes in our saliva. Uh, an enzyme called amylase starts to break down starches and lipase starts to break down fats. We finish up most of our uh, digestion of the uh, of starches in our stomach. <clears throat> and I'll get more on that in a minute here. So once we get through the stomach, we send our food into, into the, the first 10 inches of the small intestine. It's called the duodenum. Here's where we finish up processing of proteins. Here's where we finish chopping up fats into little pieces and then absorbing them. Carbohydrates are pretty much already taken care of in the stomach. So most of our food is absorbed in the small intestine. Uh, the cells that line the small intestine are simple columnar cells. And right behind these simple columnar cells, are these fenestrated capillaries, the capillaries with the sieves, the openings in there. You know, we use fenestrated capillaries in two regions of our body, in our glomerulus, in our uh, kidney to filter, to force plasma through the, the openings, the fenestrations. Here we absorb the nutrients that pass across the simple columnar cells are absorbed through the fenestrations. And whatever's left over, we defecate um, 
from the large intestine into the rectum into the anus. You know, so anyway, and that's how we get rid of waste materials, materials that we can't process, usually materials that are high in fiber, like the fiber from uh, <clears throat> a corn kernel. Fecal matter after, after we eat corn, we can't process the outer yellow covering of the corn kernel, so it shows up in our feces. We can process the nutrients inside, but we can't process the outer covering. We can't process <coughs> the bran on whole wheat, the outer covering of the husk of the wheat kernel. We can't process that, that, so it shows up in our fecal matter. Anything that's high in fiber that is is un indigestible. It shows up in our feces. Now our digestive system has two key parts, two, two separate sets of structures. That's what I'm trying to say. We have the digestive system proper of the mouth, the pharynx, the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine, we might as well say the rectum and the anus. Those are the areas that food pass through. The pharynx is our throat. It's that tube from the nasal cavity to the larynx that we use for air and food and water. And we separated the larynx into two separate passageways. The accessory structures do a lot of work for us, but don't have food pass through them. It passes around them, but not through them. We have the teeth, our tongue, our salivary gland, or glands, or our three sets of salivary glands, our liver to detoxify all the food, our gallbladder to release bile to break down fats, our pancreas to help break down proteins. So uh, we use all these accessory structures to get things done, but we don't have food actually passing through them. So now our small, our digestive tract has pretty much the same arrangements throughout. It consists of four layers. From the outside in, we have connective tissue. Uh, we, uh, it's a fibrous connective tissue that holds all of our organs in place. And when we look at our cadaver model, and you see every, all the organs held together, we know that, that our liver is on the right, our liver is here and our stomach is here and our right below our diaphragm. Uh, and we know that the small intestine is right below that, just like we would see in our cadaver model over there. Um, it, how are they, why are they held there? How, why do they stay there? Why don't they all just sag to the bottom of the abdominal cavity? Well, it's because of this connective tissue, this adventitia that holds everything in place. If we move inside of the connective tissue, we run into two layers of smooth muscle. We have a circular layer and a longitudinal layer. The, the smooth muscle layer is going to be able to squeeze in two different directions. We can squeeze it in a circ circular effort right at any different, any given location, or we can squeeze longitudinally. And by squeezing you know, the, the digestive tract flat or squeezing it in a ring, we push food through the digestive tract, this is the process of peristalsis. You know, it, it's, it's the, the analogy is the pig and the python. You know, a python swallows a pig uh, and the pig, the lump in the python gradually moves down the python's digestive tract and it's visible, you know, so. Moving further in, we run into a layer called the submucosa. The submucosa, submucosa is also connective tissue and it supports the mucous membrane layer, the mucus layer. The mucous membrane is made of stratified squamous epithelial cells because there is a lot of wear and tear as food goes through. You know, it's, it, it's while it's not a rough surface, while it's a lubricated surface, there's still wear and tear. It's like the inside of our mouth is stratified squamous epithelial cells. If we ha had ever had actually gotten to scrape the cheek cells, 
from the inside of our mouth in AP1, in AP1 lab, like we used to do pre-COVID, then you would see you, your, your, your slide that you would have made would show you lots and an abundance of, of squamous epithelial cells that you scraped off, stratified layers of this for wear and tear, plus many goblet cells. The goblet cells are the mucus generators. If you look over here in the microscopic, on the slide of this, all these little white structures here are goblet cells. These are all simple columnar along the side here. And we see many, lots and lots, you know, technical term, uh, goblet cells to lubricate the food or whatever is going through the digestive tract. So this is what our, what our digestive system pretty much looks like from, from our mouth to our anus. The only place where we add a third layer of muscle is in the stomach. We have a third layer, we call it the oblique layer, because we have a longitudinal layer and a circular layer. We add an oblique layer so that the, the stomach can churn in three different directions. So the mucus layer, the inner lining, the simple columnar epithelial, um, it is, um, uh, releases a great deal of mucus, so we can lubricate the passage of food uh, going through here. In the, in the small intestine, it is all simple columnar. Um, in other areas, it's stratified squamous. So our muscle layers are circular and longitudinal. Uh, the innermost layer is the circular layer. It, squeeze, it squeezes in a ring. Yeah, you know, and it will squeeze a section and squeeze another section and squeeze another section, whereas the longitudinal layer can squeeze lengthwise long, long segments of the muscle. And so you squeeze lengthwise, and then you squeeze in a circle, and you squeeze lengthwise, and squeeze in a circle, and it pushes stuff through the digestive tract, it pushes it down through the esophagus, it pushes it down through the small intestine, it pushes it out of the large intestine. So, and the, the third, the oblique, there is a third layer of smooth muscle generally found only in the stomach. Uh, and that is again, to give us the ability to turn our food around. Now, the thing to remember is that while the inside of the digestive tract is open to the outside and lined with epithelial cells and mucous membrane, the outside covering of the digestive tract is covered with serous membrane. It's covered with serous membrane. Let me show you here on this model what I'm talking about. Let's. Okay. Here we have a reasonably close to life-size model of our digestive tract. And what we're looking at here, just a little bit, what we're looking at here is, you can see the large intestine here, and there we go. You can see the large intestine here and the small intestine in here. Now, the mucous membrane layer is down inside here. Let me, uh, or in, in, here we go, this might work. Okay, this will work. If you look here, here we go, right in here and right over here. And there's another layer I'm trying to find. Where is that? I'll turn the camera around. That'll work. And what we're looking at, there we go. There. This is what I wanted. This is the mucus layer right inside here. This is mucous membrane in here. And you have uh, goblet cells secreting lots of mucus. The outside of the, of the digestive tract is here's the large intestine right there 
and we have the small intestine right next to it. Here we see uh, down here, we're gonna have the, uh, we'll see if this is the lining of the stomach. There's part of the small intestine right there. And what happens is that the outer layer, the, the outer membrane of this is serous membrane. This, is, this layer out here is called covered with serous membrane so that we don't have friction. We don't like friction. So serous membrane is just the same as mucous membrane, it's just about location. The outer covering of our digestive tract is covered with serous membrane, two layers, a visceral layer and a parietal layer, just like any other location, like our lungs have a visceral pleura, serous membrane covering the surface of the lungs and a parietal pleura that sticks to the inside of the chest wall. And in between we have this goopy layer of serous flu fluid so we don't have any friction. We have it in, in the heart, we have the visceral pericardium and a parietal pericardium and serous fluid in between. Here on the, in the abdominal cavity surrounding the digestive tract, we have the visceral peritoneum and the parietal peritoneum with serous fluid in between. Serous fluid is mucus. The serous membrane is the same as the mucous membrane. We, wanna, we don't wanna have any friction occurring in the, in the large intestine or the small intestine um, as, as nutrients are pushing through here because we know that our stomach will churn. We've all heard our stomach growling at some point. We've heard, we've felt it move. We know that we can get bloated uh, with what we eat. We know that our small intestine turns, and moves through here, and we get gassy and uncomfortable. The movement of food through our small and large intestine and leaving our stomach also create friction on the outside. We don't want friction. We don't want to be rubbing up a things and have it hurt. So we lubricate everything. So we, that's what the serous membrane does on the outside. Just like the inside of the digestive tract is lined with mucous membrane and epithelial cells uh, that are highly lubricated with lots of mucus from the goblet cells so that food coming through doesn't irritate. We also lubricate the outside so any kind of movement doesn't irritate also. Okay, now let's get back to where I was. So serous membrane, the outer portion of the serous membrane is the visceral per, uh, peritoneum. The, the lining of the abdominal cavity is called the peritoneum. All the organs share the peritoneum. The visceral peritoneum is stuck to all the organs of the abdominal cavity. The parietal peritoneum is the inside lining of the abdominal cavity with a serous layer in between. So, so I just said the visceral peritoneum covers most of the organs in the abdominal cavity and we line the inner wall with the, the parietal peritoneum, but to help hold things in place, not, it's not enough that they're just stuck together. We also have membranes that hold things in place. These are called the mesenteries. They are extensions of the peritoneum and they hold the liver up high on the right-hand side, the stomach up high on the left-hand side, the pancreas behind the stomach, uh, the gallbladder next to the liver, the small intestine it curls itself around directly underneath the large intestine. So everything fits together and is held in place by the, 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 glue, the glue effect of the serous membrane and the mesenteries. Okay. Let's start here at the mouth. In the mouth, we start the entry of food. We start chewing, we swallow. Um, we use our teeth, we use our tongue, we use salivary glands, uh, we uh, use our mandible, to push up, push the teeth up against our maxilla, and then we swallow. And so we are bringing food into our bodies through the mouth. We have salivary glands. 
that line the inside of the oral cavity that release that uh, release saliva. Uh, we have three sets of these. We have the parotid gland, we have the submandibular gland, and the sublingual gland. The parotid glands are located on either side of our head, uh, just below the earlobe, uh, below and in front of the earlobe. They're very large glands. The submandibulars are on either side of the mandible, and the sublingual are under the tongue. You can see that here in a minute. Now, what do they do? Well, we know that saliva is mostly water. It's 99% water. It's slightly acidic. It has some sodium in there and potassium. So it is um, slight, a, a very mild, salty water. We have two types of enzymes present there, salivary amylase and salivary lipase. That you know, Amylase breaks down starches and lipase breaks down fats. We also have protection against pathogens. We have lysozyme. It's an, it's an enzyme that attacks bacteria. We have the presence of antibodies, what we call the IgA antibodies. They're sort of like a first line of defense antibody, sort of a non-specific antibody that'll go out and kill anything. We have defensins. These are mechanisms to destroy bacterial cells. We even produce cyanide to kill other uh, pathogens. So we have a, a lot going on inside our mouth uh, to protect us from food coming in. This, the, the oral cavity is the primary entrance for pathogens into our bodies, followed by the eye, because we, we rub our face, we touch our face and then we rub our eyes and whatever's on our face then enters into our body through, uh, through the eye. So, so here are the salivary glands. There's the big parotid gland right there with its duct opening up into the top portion of the oral cavity. Here's our tongue. The submandibular gland is down here in the side uh, of the mandible. And underneath the tongue is the sublingual gland here. And so we're going to release this saliva to help lubricate and dissolve and break down the food that we're eating. And then our tongue and our teeth and our mandible pushing against the maxilla are going to roll this food that we're chewing into a little ball and then swallow it. We call it a bolus. Here. There's how, just how big the parotid glands are. We can see here in the cadaver, et cetera. Uh, if you find your um, um, earlobe <clears throat> directly in front of the earlobe and down just about to the end of the uh, uh, mandible, is where your uh, parotid glands are located. Now, if we take a closer look at the mouth, we can see, you know, it's the, it, it forms the oral cavity. The nasal cavity is directly above it. The roof of the mouth is the floor of the nasal cavity. The roof of the mouth is formed by the palatine bone and what we call that the hard palate. Then we have the soft palate behind it and the uvula, the little dangly thing in the back of our throat, right behind the soft palate. There's our tongue right there. So this is the oral cavity or the oropharynx right here. This is the oral cavity here. This is the oropharynx. This is part of the portion of the pharynx, the throat that it lines the back of the oral cavity. It's continuous with the nasopharynx up here and with the laryngopharynx down here, because this is the larynx. The larynx is where we split and send air one way and food and water the other way. The, the larynx is where we have the division between the airway, which is the trachea, right here you can see the ridges, and over here behind the airway is the esophagus. The esophagus is normally a flat tube. It only opens up <clears throat> when there's food in it. Now, a prominent structure here is called the esophageal sphincter. You can see the esophageal sphincter right here. It's a ring of muscle designed to keep the esophagus closed 
until we swallow. When we swallow food, a couple of things are going to happen. The first thing that happens when we swallow food or water, the epiglottis, the structure here, is going to flip over and close off the entrance to the glottis, which is the airway. The second thing that's going to happen is the uvula and the soft palate flip up to close off the entrance to the nasal cavity. So we close off the nasopharynx. So we have two things that happen reflexively. The third thing that happens is the esophageal sphincter opens up. Normally our esophagus is closed. But when we breathe in air, we don't want to send air to our stomach. We want to send air to our, down our trachea, to our lungs. If we breathe in air and it goes into our stomach, our stomach gets bloated. So we keep the esophagus closed. That's why the esophageal sphincter is there. You know, we don't want food to go into our airway, so we have the epiglottis closing off the entrance to the glottis. So we have the esophageal sphincter closing off the esophagus for us. Hmm? Right there. That is the esophageal sphincter. See how it, how it, there's a blockage there. So, you know, that will relax when we swallow. When we swallow something, that opens up. The other two, the, the three reflexive actions. The uh, epiglottis closes to protect the airway. This is the epiglottis uh, right here. It flips over, flips over that. The soft palate and the uvula flip up to close off the nasal cavity. This is the uvula here, and this is the soft palate. And then this sphincter relaxes and opens. And as soon as we get food past the esophageal sphincter, it closes again, so it can't come back out. That's not to say it doesn't sometimes, you know, uh, but um, when we're busy expelling food, but it usually doesn't open up. Now here's a closer look at the oral cavity. We can see the tongue right here. You know, all these little bumps are the papillae where the um, taste buds are located. There's the hard palate there because the nasal cavity is right up here. But there's the hard palate there, the soft palate and the uvula. Their role is to flip up and close off the entrance to the nasal cavity. Here's the epiglottis. You can really see it well here. You know, its role is to flip over and close off the entrance to the airway. And there's the esophagus. And if you look very carefully, you can sort of see the opening, the, the esophageal sphincter right here. So now, swallowing is always voluntary. You know, it's, it's not, you know, it's under skeletal muscle control. So it's voluntary muscle. Um, we swallow when we have food in the back of our mouth. We, what we tend to do is when we chew things and mix it with saliva, we tend to form the food into a little ball, that's the bolus. And then when we swallow it, uh, the, the, the action of swallowing causes the um, nasal cavity and the trachea to close and the esophageal sphincter to open so we can move the bolus of food into the esophagus where we'll push it on down using the, the two smooth muscle layers. And this is what swallowing looks like. The esophageal sphincter is right down here in the esophagus. Remember the esophagus is between the spinal column and the uh, trachea. You can see the spinal column here. You can see all the individual vertebrae. The trachea is right here. There is the glottis. That little thing sticking up right there is the epiglottis. When we swallow, this closes down. The uvula flips up. And then the esophageal sphincter opens and whatever we, we're swallowing. And I suspect it's some sort of radio opaque dye like barium. The stuff they use for uh, you can your patient can, if if you need an X-ray of the entire uh, digestive system, uh, they can swallow what they call a barium milkshake, which is I, I gotta say it's probably better than a barium enema. I've never had either one. I don't intend to, but uh, barium 
absorbs, uh, barium reflects x-rays. So you can see with it. And so what you're seeing here is something, because if it was water, you wouldn't see anything. But it's, you can see when it passes through the esophagus, through the esophageal sphincter right down here. So, and then the esophagus will close again because the esophagus stays as a flat tube. It only opens up when food comes through it. The airway is flat. The trachea is flat on its backside to accommodate the esophagus. It's only when the esophagus has something in it does it enlarge. Okay. Now here's our oral cavity, <clears throat> the mouth. We see a number of structures here. We see 32 teeth. This is a healthy individual. We have 32 teeth. We have 16 on the maxilla and 16 on the uh, mandible. We can see the gums. We can see the hard palate um, from the palatine process of the maxilla right there. There's the soft palate and the uvula. We also see the tonsils, the palatine tonsils are here and here. We, we tend to have three sets of tonsils that form a ring around the airway. Because this is a, the, the tonsils function uh, sacrificially. They're designed to become infected to trigger uh, our immune response. So that they can become infected before it becomes a systemic infection. They become infected, the immune system responds to that and does a body-wide response. It isn't like a localized, but it's always body-wide. And so you may have your tonsils infected and not know you have an infection because you're busy fighting it, or you may have had your tonsils out. You know, um, class yesterday, it was 50-50 between tonsils in and tonsils out. Do your tonsils? So do I. So now it's 100%. In a, in a classroom, so, um, so I don't either. So, so oh my, I mine were removed. So, uh, but mine were, and I'll talk about that. Mine were really easy. They were just yanked out. So, uh, anyway, didn't even get to have any good painkillers either. So, yeah, I know. Anyway. Oh, great. That's right. You have your, yeah. Okay. Now, we have 32 adult teeth. When we are born, we have no teeth, but somewhere around the age of six months, teeth start erupting through the gum line. Um, and we get about, there's about 20, what we call deciduous or milk teeth. Now, you can see here are uh, all these teeth down here are the deciduous teeth. So we have about 20 of those, 10 on each, uh, uh, on the mandible and 10 on the max, maxilla. They start coming, falling out somewhere around six years of age. So between six and 12, we gradually lose all those teeth because the permanent teeth are underneath them and they're pushing out. And if you look here, you can see the, our permanent teeth are, we say that they're erupting, they're pushing out and pushing the uh, deciduous teeth out, pushing them away and they, they fall out. And you know, when we were kids, we all had a period of where we, you know, we were missing teeth in the front and teeth would sudden just drop out, you know. So we're six years old on, we start losing those teeth and we gradually get uh, our adult teeth. We, we get most of our adult teeth by the time uh, mid to late adolescence. We get a, the last set of adult teeth somewhere from late adolescence to early adulthood. Those are the teeth we call the wisdom teeth. They are what we call, they're actually our third molars. So let's take a look here. What kind of teeth do we have? Well, the teeth in the front, <clears throat> you have four teeth on the maxilla and four teeth in the mandible in the front called the incisors. They're shaped like a shovel or a chisel. They're designed for biting into food, like biting into an apple or biting into corn in the cob, for example. Yeah, they're, they're, they're the cutting teeth. 
because of the sharp, they have a relatively sharp edge. Yeah. So those are the incisors, four in the top, four in the maxilla, four in the mandible. We have the canines. We have two canines, one on the left and one on the right on the upper jaw and the lower jaw. So there's four canines all together. These are somewhat pointed. If you were a vampire, they'd be very pointed. But these are the pointed teeth we use for ripping and tearing foods. You know, like if you're eating barbecue and you're biting barbecue off of a bone or chicken off of a bone or something, or, you know, chicken wing, you're tearing off the meat. Uh, you, this is what you would use. You would use your canines for that. Behind the canines, we have what are known as the premolars. They're, in some places, they're still called the bicuspids. But the premolars, you have two, two premolars on each side behind the canines. So you have four premolars down on the mandible and four premolars on the maxilla. And behind that, you have three molars on each side, up and down. And so the molars and the premolars are designed for crushing and grinding. You know, you're eating uh, rice, you're eating cereal, you're eating things with, you're eating lettuce, you're eating a salad, you're chewing up spinach. Um, you know, anything that involves uh, a chewing and crushing and grinding, you know, you're eating um, pretzels, you're eating peanuts, you're eating uh, a big leafy salad with, you know, lots of you know, carrots and tomatoes and stuff like that in it. You would, that's the crushing and grinding. So, so they look like this. The incisors, they're flat. Uh, they have a, a flat edge to them. They're shaped somewhat like a, a shovel or a chisel. Uh, the uh, canines uh, have, the, have the pointed edge, pointed end to them. And then you have the molars and the premolars. So you have, so there are the, right here in the front, there are the four incisors. There's a canine there and a canine over here. You have two premolars here and here. And then you have three molars here and here. The last molar, the third molar is what we refer to as our wisdom teeth. They don't erupt until late adolescence, early adulthood. They only cause a problem if they come in sideways or crooked or underneath the second molar. And they do that sometimes. They come in sideways, they come in, uh, they can come in in any direction. They can push, come in at an angle and push against the second molar. And so then you have to have them taken out. Now, sometimes, and, and in many people, the third molar comes in with no trouble at all. It's only when we have a complication do we have to have the third molar. You, know, you have to, as they say, have your wisdom teeth cut out because they're doing something they're not supposed to be doing. Uh, and so we have them removed. Many people have their, their third molar come in with no trouble at all, or they don't come in at all. You know, it, it's, and it's all fine. So, yeah. So here, here's a tooth. The structures of the tooth are pretty unique. Um, we have the hard, two hardest structures in the, in the body are found in the teeth. The outer covering of the tooth is called the enamel. That is the hardest substance in our body. Directly underneath that is the second hardest substance known as the dentin. The enamel is, is as hard as bone or even harder because of the presence of calcium and phosphate salts embedded in, the, in our matrix there. Now, a tooth is alive because underneath the dentin, we have a, uh, what we call a pulp cavity. And we have canals that extend down for the passage of blood vessels and nerves into the pulp cavity. And so, we, you know, while the outer covering is, inor is inorganic, it's calcium and phosphate, the inner portion of the tooth is, is living material. Now, there's the dentin, 
and that area there that sticks up above the, the gum line. This is the gum line right here where this red area is. That's the gum line. That is called the crown of the tooth. That's more enamel there. No, this is the uh, pulp cavity and we're leading into the root canal. Um, this, this is the root canal down here that runs all the way out and there's an opening at each end uh, for the nerves and blood vessels to go through. There's the root. And the gingiva, this is another name for the uh, gum line, the gingiva. Inflammation of the gum line is called gingivitis. So we've all probably heard of that. Now this pink area here is called the periodontal ligament. It's what holds the, it's one of the two mechanisms we use to hold the tooth in place. The tooth is glued in place by this white layer here. This is a, what we call cementum, this white layer. But then on the outside of that is this ligament. And if you've ever had a tooth removed, uh, the dentist usually will say something to the effect of, you're going to feel a lot of pressure, but you're not going to feel a lot of pain. Because, of course, hopefully you've been pro properly anesthetized uh, at this point. Uh, but to extract a tooth involves literally popping it free from that periodontal ligament. And so when it pops loose, when you, you, you push away the cementum and the, the ligament's holding it tightly in, in the socket, and then you pop it out. And anybody that's ever had a tooth extracted can often always say that, well, it didn't hurt. There was a lot of pressure because you know, the, the dentist is manipulating that tooth and push and pr literally prying it out, you know. And it always feels like they're using a great big pry bar when they're not really. At least I've never seen a pry bar. Anyway, so cementum holds the tooth and the root to the periodontal ligament. Um, that the periodontal ligament holds it into the the bone itself of the jaw of the mandible and maxilla. The area called dentin is like bone under the enamel, and it is maintained by what are known as odontoblasts. So we can build new dentin. The pulp cavity is surrounded by the dentin and the living portion of the tissues and blood vessels are in the pulp. And we have the root canal and there's a foramen uh, in the root that allows the passage of these blood vessels. Typical tooth right there. Crown, neck, root. Here's the periodontal ligament. Here is the cementum layer there. The gingiva is the gum line. There's the pulp cavity. There is the dentin and there's the enamel. Now, if a patient has <clears throat> root canal, root canal usually, root canal procedure involves taking the top off of the tooth. You know, the tooth is badly abscessed. The tooth, part of the tooth could still be saved uh, to hold it in place. Because, you know, a dentist does not like to move, remove teeth out of the gum line because other teeth then start to move around. It's just not, you know, it, it's not a good thing to have teeth extracted if it can be avoided. What a dentist will do <clears throat> is have the top of the tooth taken off. You know, the, the crown of the tooth will be removed, exposing the pulp cavity. And the pulp cavity can be cleaned out and all of the contents removed. Now, your patient is fully anesthetized, a local anesthetist anesthetic, like a whole boatload of Novocaine to do this. The, the crown is removed, the um, pulp cavity is exposed, the root canal is exposed, it's cleaned out, it's packed then with some sort of plastic material as a filler, and then a temporary crown is placed on top of the neck, followed by a permanent crown. So a person with that has root canal will usually have a, um, you know, most crowns these days are gold uh, covered with uh, porcelain. So they look natural, you know, 
earlier crowns would be gold. Uh, gold has the strength and durability that we want to chew with, but uh, gold's expensive. But you know, most people go with uh, with a porcelain covered uh, uh, crown because gold crown because it is more aesthetically pleasing. You don't, your mouth doesn't look like there's a whole bunch of silver or gold in there. Older people that had a lot of silver amalgam fillings, that's what was used for years. They open their mouth and all you see are layers of uh, silver. You know, generally what happens is at some point you get that silver replaced with uh, a, a more modern uh, filling material. The filling, uh, what a filling does is they simply drill out all the affected area and put the filling in and the filling is some sort of um, polymer that is off-white and it looks natural. So anyway, uh, lots of people have root canals to save their teeth in place. Oops, let me get back up here. But you know, sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it doesn't take, because the, the tooth is to some extent weaker because of, of the fact that it's no longer alive. But it is holding a place there so the other teeth can't move around. Now, uh, problems with your teeth, cavities. Who hasn't had a cavity at some point? You know, you've never had a cavity. Good for you. Well, I think I might have had one, but it was in a baby tooth. Yeah, they don't count, you know. Yeah, so. it fell out, so it's not Yeah. Cavities can be prevented with good dental hygiene. I sound like a commercial. And the term for a, ca uh, a cavity is called dental caries. Bacteria living on your teeth will eat the plaque and the tartar ar around the tooth and residual foods from, from poor cleaning. And they will secrete waste products that dissolve um, the uh, enamel. And then they can dissolve the dentin. And then the bacteria will continue to grow and then the tooth will get weaker and weaker. And <clears throat> if you penetrate the dentin layer, if you penetrate and then get into the uh, pulp cavity, you now have an abscessed tooth. And that becomes a candidate then for root canal. So if, if, the ca if your patient has a cavity and it's caught fairly early, then you can treat it with a filling. So, now the, so we call this the dental caries. This picture here is a normal bacterial population on the surface of, of a tooth that has just been brushed. It's just clean now. So keeping the bacteria off our teeth is a losing proposition because it's always there. All we can do is hope to keep knocking it down when we brush. Now the plaque that forms is the residual sugars from the food that we eat, <clears throat> the um, bacteria that are living there, and any debris. And as I said, those bacteria, their waste products are, are acidic and kind of sort of, it will dissolve the enamel. And any um, organic material that's there too will release these digestive enzymes too. To stop that, to prevent dental caries, you encourage your patients to brush and floss daily, several times a day. You know, if we can hold the line and keep cleaning our teeth daily, we're not gonna get cavities. You know, if, if we don't, then cavities are likely inevitable. And they can look like this. Now, you know, the, these teeth, the best I can say about them is they, you know, yeah, they look sort of off-white. They look sort of like we want teeth to look, but until we get to the, to the ones on the on the far, on the right hand side of the picture, and the one on the far side is gone. It's it's down to the root canal. It needs to come out. The same with the, the two the other two. You know, the one the one here has exposed the um, root canal too. I don't know what this is. I just don't know what that black spot is or over here. But we also see the accumulation of plaque and tartar. That's all this stuff growing around the teeth here. And these are the gums. 
Now notice that the gums are inflamed. This is, you know, what we have when we have gingivitis, that the gums are inflamed. Inflammation means there's irritation there, some sort of bacterial issue going on, uh, and we have increased blood flow. This person, when they brush their teeth, are going to have bleeding. The gums are going to bleed, and it's going to hurt. So what happens if it hurts to brush our teeth? We're not going to do it. We don't want to see the bleeding. We don't want to hurt, so we don't do it. And we end up looking like this. We end up having this kind of condition. And this condition has got to be more painful and unpleasant than brushing our teeth and having it bleed a little bit. Because this will lead to gingivitis, uh, um, an overall case of gingivitis. Notice how this, this is all inflammation in here. It must, it probably even hurts to eat to, for, uh, for this person. We have, uh, we break down the, the barrier between the gum and the tooth. Bacteria get into this, into this area between the gum and the tooth and it, it tends to thrive there because of this, the tartar that has accumulated. The, the tartar, the plaque that has formed, the, the bacteria and the food and the waste product and everything else uh, calcifies. It forms tartar breaks the seal, bacteria move in. We inflame the gums. It hurts, our it hurts to brush our teeth, our teeth bleed. And you know, they don't, these teeth don't look that bad, except we, if you look carefully, you can see a lot of plaque and tartar accumulation here, there, over here. This tooth is really suspect. A couple of them over here are pretty suspect too. This, is, this, can, this condition can be reversed pretty easily with a good cleaning. And, and good maintenance, you know, but it's hard to do, you know, because again, if it hurts to do something, we're not prone to do it. So we deal with, you know, issues of dental hygiene all the time. Okay, now, a, a much more serious condition that occurs besides plaque and cavities, you know, a lot, lots of people are resigned to the fact that they're probably going to end up having their teeth removed so they can have dentures. And because, you know, their grandparents have dentures, their parents have dentures, they might as well have dentures themselves. And it happens. And so they do. And, uh, you know, because of the poor maintenance that they had before, because they, that's just how they were raised. So, uh, but one of the problems we have with um, tooth decay is that you can, your patient can develop something known as periodontis, periodontitis, I'm sorry, there's an extra I in there, periodontitis. Immune cells, which um, our immune system cells attack both us and pathogens, they destroy the periodontal ligament, the ligament that's holding the tooth into the socket. They turn on uh, the osteoclast, the bone breaking cells. And so we start, not, we start losing teeth. We start seeing breakdown of gum, I mean, of the bone, you know, we're, we're, losing, we're losing bone. We're losing our teeth here because of periodontitis. Uh, this, is an, this is a, uh, our immune system attacks the pathogens and the cells that the pathogens are attack are infecting. The worst, the, 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 the least possible complication is going to be tooth loss. But the worst that can happen is that this, the, this bacteria that's present can migrate itself uh, in, it can make its way into the blood supply and affect the heart. It can infect the uh, valves. It can affect uh, the clot formation. It can lead to coronary artery disease and sudden death. Yeah, so this is a complication from teeth. Now, now that we've gotten past the mouth and we've pushed our food into the esophagus, 
it's a pretty good straight shot right into the um, uh, into the stomach. Not much happens in the esophagus except the food passes down there. It's pushed down by the layers of smooth muscle and it gets to the bottom of the esophagus and there is a sphincter, a ring of muscle that guards entry into the uh, stomach itself. And it's called the cardiac sphincter. The cardiac sphincter will open up when there's the presence of food yeah, at, the, at the base of the esophagus, it will open up and allow the passage of the bolus of food that we've swallowed into the stomach. Now our stomach has four distinct regions. It has an area called the cardiac region. That is the, it is called that because it is closest to the heart. We have a, the area called the fundus, which is a bulge near the top. Remember we used the term fundus we were, uh, as a structure in the uterus. We have the pyloric region and we have the body. When we swallow food down our esophagus, down into our esophagus, it goes down to the cardiac sphincter, which lets that bolus enter into the cardiac region of the stomach. It will then go directly into the fundus so that amylase, if amylase is there, if, if we have been eating carbohydrates, if amylase is, is present, before we get into the stomach proper, the, the food is pushed up into the fundus so that the amylase can continue its job or finish its job of breaking down carbohydrates. Amylase functions around a pH of 7 to 7.2. That's what we have inside our mouth. The pH in our stomach, down in the body of the stomach, is about 2, not 7.2, but 2. It's very acidic. Amylase, as an enzyme, can't function with that low a pH. So we push it into the fundus. And then after, from there, it will move into, it will be churned throughout the rest of the stomach. And then eventually, what is left out, what has been processed now, will be pushed through the pyloric sphincter at the bottom of the stomach. And this, these areas, look, I'll show you here and then I'll show you the other model. Here's our stomach. There's the esophagus coming into the top of the stomach. There is the duodenum, the first 10 inches or so of the small intestine. There is the cardiac sphincter or the esophageal, uh, We'll just call it the cardiac sphincter. There's the pyloric sphincter connecting the stomach to the duodenum. There's the fundus, the top portion of the uh, stomach. We, you know, the carbohydrates move up into here with the amylase. There's the cardiac region right there. So we go from we come into here and go up there. We move down into the body over here as we're turning around and then eventually we head towards the pyloric region so we can go through the sphincter here. We have lesser curvature. If we have lesser, we gotta have a greater, there's the greater curvature. We have three layers of smooth muscle, longitudinal, circular, and oblique right there. So we can turn in three different directions. And let me bring up the, over here is our, this is pretty much life size uh, of our uh, stomach. And we can see this is our esophagus up here. You know, we go, we swallow, we come down from the oral cavity right here, down past the, uh, trachea, the larynx and come down the esophagus here and the esophagus then enters into the uh, cardiac sphincter right here. <clears throat> and this is our stomach, the cardiac sphincter. The cardiac region is this area. The fundus is this area up near the top of the stomach. So any carbohydrates with amylase are going to go here. Moves into the body, moves into the pyloric region, through the pyloric sphincter and into the duodenum 
down here, and you can just see a little bit of it leading here, uh, going on down into the rest of the small intestine. Now, these ridges that you see here, these are called rugae. These ridges are designed <clears throat> to increase the surface area for churning and contact. Because not only are we going to churn the contents of the food uh, in three different directions, we're also going to soak it with gastric juices that are going to have from five <clears throat> or six different types of um, glands to break down the contents. We've, we've started out the process of digestion in the mouth with both mechanical digestion by chewing and manipulating and also chemical digestion by releasing the, these enzymes, the amylase and the lipase. Here in the stomach, we continue the process of mechanical digestion by you know, swirling it all around, exposing it to all these chemicals and just helping to break it apart so we have both mechanical and chemical digestion once we get past the stomach into the small intestine down here, then we're going to have chemical digestion, you know, and some mechanical is we're going to chop. Well, I guess it would be chemicals because we're going to chop up the fat in there. So anyway, so this is what's going to happen here in our stomach. And, and the stomach is life. This is a life size model here. I'll show you just how big our stomach is. I just put this on my hand. Where's my, there's my hand. Okay, so to give you an idea, that's how big our stomach is. It'll set in your hand. So it's not very big at all. That's, we, we call it a J-shaped structure. It sits on the left-hand side of the abdominal cavity, right underneath the diaphragm, directly across from the liver, which is on the right side. So now let's go out of this and back to our stomach. Here's our stomach again. We see the esophagus, the duodenum, the gastroesophageal sphincter, otherwise known as the cardiac sphincter, cardiac region, fundus region, body region, pyloric region, lesser curvature, greater curvature. So this is what the inside of the stomach looks like. These ridges that you see down here, these large ridges are the rugae. These are the rugae. These are the folds that increase the surface area. We have our muscle layers out here. We have all three muscle layers. We have the submucosa. This is mucous membrane. You have lots and lots of goblet cells in here. You can see there's one. There's, there's a whole lot of goblet cells in here. The mucus that the goblet cells secrete is alkaline because the, in, the contents of the stomach is very acidic. It runs around pH of two because of the release of hydrochloric acid. There's our stomach lumen right there, muscle layers, submucosa, blood vessel, the mucus layer. And this is a rugae, ridges and ridges and ridges inside the stomach to increase the surface area, also to help turn the food around. So and there's the lumen. Now, this is what it looks like. Actual stomach right here with the rugae, drawing of the same region, three layers of smooth muscle on the, on the outside of the, the stomach, uh, the rugae to uh, expose food to all the different, uh, the, 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 the five or six different uh, chemicals that make up the gastric juices. There's your pyloric sphincter there, and your cardiac sphincter is hidden by the muscles up here. So, yeah. again, there's our there's our model. Rugae, cardiac sphincter at that end, pyloric sphincter at that end. Food comes in here, gets processed, and comes out here. The consistency of the food that's coming out is, we call it chyme, C-H-Y-M-E. It has the consistency of condensed soup. You ever open a can of condensed soup? It's, you know, it, um, uh, yesterday someone said they'll never eat cream of mushroom again. 
as I said, use that as my analogy. You open up a can of condensed cream of mushroom soup, I don't know why you would, uh, but you open up and dump it out in, into the bowl or into the pan, and it still has the shape of the can. It's sort of goopy looking and just sort of sort of jelly-like. That's what chyme is like coming out from the stomach and going into the small intestine. Uh, now, it, this chyme has been exposed to juices coming out of the gastric pits. And we have a series of gastric glands in these pits making a variety of chemicals that we're going to expose the food to. We have five types of cells in here, in addition to stem cells. So the first we encounter are the chief cells. The chief cells make something called pepsinogen. Pepsinogen is the inactive form of pepsin. Pepsin is an enzyme that breaks down protein. Now, just like a lot of other uh, chemicals that form in our bodies, it's a two-step process. Pepsinogen is the inactive form of pepsin. It will become active when exposed to hydrochloric acid. Well, fortunately, the second set of cells in the, in the, in the pits are called parietal cells. They release hydrochloric acid, which activates the pepsinogen, converts it to pepsin, and breaks down protein, separate, breaks it down to its amino acids. It also, uh, the parietal cells also release intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor is what we need to absorb B12. No B12, uh, we develop pernicious anemia. We also have goblet cells that release lots of mucus. And these goblet cells uh, and mucus glands are releasing a mucus that is alkaline to neutralize the hydrochloric acid. Otherwise, we would burn through the layers of our, um, of our stomach. Even though the cells are held together with tight junctions, they still have to be covered with a layer of alkaline mucus so we don't burn through the layer. And then we have uh, a series of endocrine cells, enteroendocrine, they are internal endocrine cells that produce gastrin. Gastrin tells us when we're full, helps us in the digestive process. And then underneath all that, we have stem cells that can make anything we need of these five types. So, Pepsin forms when hydrochloric acid activates pepsinogen. The parietal cells also produce intrinsic factor. We keep the layers of the stomach wall covered with this alkaline mucus, and we churn and churn and churn, expose the, uh, the cells to hydrochloric acid, and we, then we expose them to pepsin, and we break down the proteins here. But we're not done. We have to do more in the small intestine. So here's what the, 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 pits, the, the pits look like. These are the pits with the glands inside here, mucus glands, parietal, gland, parietal cell glands, gastric glands, chief cells in here. And we, but we line the walls of the stomach with this. And we've already said this, we have three layers. So when we produce the, 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 the chyme, the, acid, the chyme is very acidic. When we produce it, we are turning it all the way around. And it is very acidic in its own self. So we have to neutralize the acidity when the chyme enters the small intestine. So, and there's what the gastric glands look like in the pits. You know, they're pretty deep structures in here, but we're busy making all the different chemicals we need. Okay. So this, I think this will be our last point for today. Digestion in the stomach is both mechanical and chemical. Um, we produce chyme. Um, we have broken down the food into its individual components and we mix it with the gastric juices so we can convert, uh, we can have chemical breakdown too. We can break down proteins using the pepsin that we've made. We can, uh, activate, we can absorb vitamin B12, we can uh, move the uh, 
the chyme around so we get ready to push it through the small intestine, through the pyloric sphincter. We don't do a lot of absorption of nutrients in the stomach. However, we do absorb water. We can we absorb glucose. We pick up salts. Alcohol is absorbed in the stomach, as well as fat-soluble medications. So uh, when your patient takes fat-soluble vitamins, they're going to get absorbed in the stomach. Uh, certain other medications irritate the stomach. Uh, you know, they say, like, take um, Advil, take it with food, because it is a non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory drug, and it irritates the lining of the stomach. So you take it with food so it doesn't irritate. So most of our food absorption is going to take place in the small intestine. And we will stop here. So we have something to look forward to next week with ulcers. So any questions on anything? Is that part of the So with like certain antibiotics, is that where they say you take like dairy, just like for yogurt or something, because it irritates the stomach. Exactly, it irritates the lining of the stomach. It um, the gastric juices uh, will react with the antibiotic, and they may destroy the antibiotic, you know, because they're they're very acidic. The the dairy product neutralizes it, so I you, you want to avoid that. Plus, it'll just make you feel really uncomfortable too. So, sure. I was on like several different antibiotics uh, like a year ago, like four in a month. Mm -hmm. And there was one that they said I was not allowed to have calcium, anything with calcium. I couldn't eat. Okay. The whole time I was on the medication, they didn't ever explain why. Hmm. So I was just like kind of wondering what that I've was. heard of that off the top of my head. I can't remember what I'll find out for you. So I, I, the, the calcium. Like it, I couldn't eat anything. It may affect the ability to, uh, okay, well, okay, this makes sense. What does calcium do? Calcium neutralizes the acid in the stomach. The antibiotic may need the acid to break it down so it can be used and absorbed. That makes sense. That makes sense. I mean, that's, yeah, yeah that does make sense. Yeah, also, just off the top of my head, what does calcium do? You know, it's an acid. So you take calcium, uh, you neutralize, uh, the stomach acid. In that case, the antibiotic must need it. So I don't remember what, the, what it was. Yeah. So well, if I if I remember, I'll try to look it up when I get a chance. So. I mean, that makes sense. Okay. Just for stomach infection thing, and I don't we don't okay. know what it was. So. None of the medication worked. So okay, that was good questions. So okay, I'm going to get us out of here, and I will see you all next week.